check. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to this uh, today's session on Cisco Platform Exchange Grid, or we like to call it as PX Grid for short. So today, uh, so my name is Brian Gonzalez. I'm a product manager uh, with the Cisco Identity Services Ecosystem Business Unit, and my distinguished colleague Nancy Cam Winget is the is a distinguished engineer for the Security Business Group. She's one of the uh, uh, architects of PX3, and she'll talk to you more about it in, in technical detail. So uh, today's agenda is I'll talk to you, give you an, uh, an overview of what PX3 is, uh, the use cases of where we can use PX3, why our customers can leverage and benefit using PX3 and ICE, and from a developer perspective, how to get started developing uh, your applications into PX3 and some use cases around that. So uh, a show of hands, how many of you folks are familiar with Cisco Identity Services Engine? OK, perfect. So um, a, as you know, ICE is our uh, next gen NAC on steroids, basically AAA, RADIUS, but also we understand profiling, we do posture, we understand BYOD, and uh, in in authenticating uh, users onto the network, we gain a lot of context. And by context, what I mean is who the user is, what device he's coming from, did he come over wired, wireless, or VPN, uh, what time of day, uh, what location, et cetera. So uh, all this context is kind of useful, not only for us to take policy decisions for access control, but we can share this with third-party devices so that uh, you can have a one plus one equal to four or five effect because now the solution, the joint solution, kind of helps a customer uh, answer, answer simple use cases but also complex ones. So to give you an example, um, if you look at, say, uh, a tenable Nessus scanner and you, know, you are connected and doing a scan on the network, and you find there's an egregious IP address on 192.168.1.1. Um, it's not very actionable. But if we provide user context to that IP address, and now the Nessus scanner says, uh, OK, this IP address is, uh, is Brian, but he's come on a jailbroken iPad. He came in at non-business hours. That is more context that's more relevant. So, we as ICE, Identity Service Engine, can provide that context to a third-party platform. So having IP address attribution is a better use case so that you can take intelligent decisions in your uh, resolving, you know, when you're trying to look at incidents, et cetera. The other use case of why we have an ecosystem and why we develop PX Grid to help with that ecosystem is we as ICE can learn context from our third-party vendors. So. Take, for example, our MDM ecosystem. So today, ICE has a slew of uh, very healthy ecosystem, all the big MDM players, the Mobile Irons, the SAPs, the AirWatch, et cetera. What that provides to us is that we now get endpoint posture on mobile devices that we don't do inherently. So from this perspective, it is ICE now gaining more better intelligence and using that in policy so you can write access policy which says, if it's a jailbroken iPad, put, put this user in a quarantine VLAN. Or if it's a rooted Samsung device, you know, uh, put this assign SGT value 200. That means you, know, you need to basically redirect him to another segment of traffic. So it gives a single pane of uh, comprehensive network access policy to ICE. So it's not just simple access policy, but now augmented access policy. And the third use case is uh, more of a sleeper function that we've, uh, that's been there, but we're exposing that even more. And th that is giving the power of taking mitigation actions to the third party. So what do I mean by that? So this example of the Nessus vulnerability scanner, when uh, the admin of, of Nessus found this vulnerability, what would happen is that he would pick up the phone, call his counterpart on the, on the network side and say, hey, this person has a vulnerability, trim off the network, or set up, you know, send an email to the, uh, the team that's handling the endpoints. What we have done is we've provided a way of uh, using ICE and PX Grid for third-party vendors to take action back into the Cisco network. 
So in this example, uh, the admin on the Nessus scanner right clicks on that record and says quarantine using ICE PX thread. So what happens is that through PX thread, we, 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 send a, uh, we send a remediation quarantine action back to ICE. ICE and then will do radius change of authorization, remove that endpoint into a uh, form of compliant state to non-compliant state, either chuck him off the network, and so on and so forth. So the benefit here is that uh, we, are, we are reducing time to remediate for security events. So that's the power of what we're bringing to this. So uh, I'll talk a little more about uh, how we're doing this using our ecosystem and PX grid. But to, uh, to, uh, to give another example, um, a good use case that we're seeing today is um, access into cloud. Right? We have a lot of a lot of data, a lot of um, customers are moving to cloud-based uh, you know, cloud or SaaS applications. So everything's moving to the cloud. So you've got folks who are trying to access, uh, uh, say, sales data, which is in say, salesforce.com. So today, from an IT perspective, from an InfoSec perspective, the access criteria is typically who the user and the group and the person connects. But what we are seeing is that because uh, most of the breaches occur due to pure rules, let's kind of enhance that kind of, uh, enhance that kind of request. So in this use case, what we're doing using ICE and PX Grid is we have a vendor, we, have a, we basically have an ecosystem of IAM SSO partners that are connecting to PX Grid and leveraging that context. So in, in this use case, what happens is you've got uh, an access policy which says, if it's, if it's an executive and he's on a non-mobile device, he's coming in from the UK, in this example, only during business hours, give him access to Salesforce reports. Uh, if not, give him access only to uh, less sensitive data. So what happens here in the, in the background is that uh, when the user is trying to go to Salesforce, Ping Identity, who is the SSO SAML provider, contacts ICE, finds out that the user is a registered user, he's part of the exec group, and he has the right credentials. So now, broker the SAML connection back to Salesforce and give him access. Now, if uh, the same gentleman came in over a non-registered device, maybe the policy would be only allow him access to reports, but not maybe financial data. So that kind of uh, scaled access is uh, what we can provide with the context that we provide to ICE. So how does this all work? Um, and I'll talk about why we came up with the policy exchange grid. Typical integrations are done uh, with, between uh, two, uh, two kind of entities using either an API or syslog integration, et cetera. But uh, ICE, because of its day job of learning all this big context, and we found uh, we, we, we needed to get a better way of scaling, a better way of sharing this contextual information. And doing REST API one-off integrations you know, didn't cut it. We needed to have a better way of doing it. So we basically developed what is called the a policy exchange grid. So today, Cisco ICE, as you know, has got multiple personas. It's got an MNT node, an admin node, and PSNs. But it also, uh, from ICE 1.3 onwards, behaves as a PX grid controller. So what I mean by that is that when you start up ICE and you enable PX grid, it kind of sets up the grid per se. And then you have third-party applications that basically connect to the grid. And just as how users are authenticated and authorized on the grid, you've got you know, maybe a land cope, you maybe have uh, Savius file packets doing performance monitoring, connecting to the grid, getting authorized, uh, getting authenticated, and a secure communication is established. And this grid is a publisher subscribe uh, bi-directional uh, way of communicating as opposed to one of APIs. So it's not just one. You can have multiple of these third-party vendors communicating onto the grid, and instead of you know, just waiting and polling for information, subscribe to uh, topics that are uh, shared on the grid. So for example, out here, I've got uh, an application that has location. He, he will publish to the, to the grid what he has to share. Another application has application information, and he needs location information. After publishing what he has to share, 
they'll look at these topics and say, hey, I'm interested in this location information, so I can subscribe to that. So the benefit now is that instead of doing polling and say, hey, do you have information? Hey, do you have information? He just subscribes and waits for that trigger to happen. So he doesn't have uh, you know, bandwidth issues on the network, load on the system comes down, et cetera. So just like how um, these applications connect to the grid, uh, ICE itself also is a consumer of the grid. So ICE can connect onto the grid, and there's a continuous uh, directed flow that happens. And there are different mechanisms. You can either do a bulk download, you can do directed queries that Nancy's going to get to in, in, in a bit. But in this way, you've got multiple folks connecting to the grid. So instead of doing one-off API in integrations, uh, our partners, what they will do is that they will stitch in their product what is called as grid control libraries. So these are SDKs that we have available to DevNet. Basically download them and stitch them into your product. And once you stitch that library into your product, you now can connect to the grid. So once you integrate once, you don't have to worry about changes into APIs, et cetera, because now you become part of the grid and you all talk the same language. So, it, so in theory, what would happen is that you have all these different third-party platforms being part of the grid, and you're exchanging information among themselves, and ICE becomes the broker to establish the, connect, you know, the secure connection. So why did we go about developing this uh, uh, policy exchange grid? And I've kind of alluded to that. APIs, we found our single purpose. For example, if um, Lanco wanted to make a change in APIs on their side, we would need to make a change on our side, and so on and so forth. So we need to wait for the next release vehicle, et cetera. By having a... I apologize. I lost my screen. It's there. It's just. Uh... Okay. So instead of si a si a single APIs, you've got um, you you've got a mechanism which is very flexible, where you don't have to wait for the next version of ICE or next version of the third-party app to make the changes. Also, uh, as I mentioned, the polling architecture is very cumbersome, uh, has performance implications. Whereas in this architecture, because it's, it's a publisher-subscribe model, it has, uh, it, it has better uh, scaling capabilities. And the reason is this. The underlying technology that we use to develop px is based on XMPP. As you know, it's our Jabber technologies. And the XMPP protocol and technology can scale to millions of subscribers. So uh, PX Grid can scale, uh, you know, doesn't have scaling issues that would ha you would have if you have multiple one-off API integrations. Also, typically security can be pretty loose with APIs. You need to make sure that the segment is protected, but what about the, uh, the authorization levels and authentication levels? So just as how users are authenticated to the grid, Third-party applications, or even Cisco applications like the WSA or, or fire, uh, Firepower services, when they connect to the PX grid, they will be authorized and authenticated to the grid, and the communication is secure. So with that, I will let uh, Nancy talk about more about the architecture and components. And if you have questions, uh, feel, feel free to ask us. Yeah, so can you guys hear me OK? I can't hear myself. Um, so I'm going to go through slides that look really busy. And I'm not going to read through them, so I'm just going to highlight the points. So if I'm going too fast and if you have questions, just feel free to ask, all right? So as Brian was saying, we built this ecosystem, if you will, or fabric, to allow for the sharing of information beginning with the very information that we're already aggregating out of the identity services engine, that being the, um, we call it the contextual information. In engineering, we say the MNT because it comes out of the MNT persona. <coughs> but in essence, that's the first example off the shoot. If you go into the DevNet pod and you look at the sandbox where you can actually play with ICE, look at the APIs, look at the code, it gives you a taste for the things that you can do. 
The pod was developed using the ICE 1.3 flavor in the newest release, which is 1.4. We've now added the capability for you to add in the XMPP speak a new topic. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit through the, the notion of how we did the SAML extensions, for instance, or some of the work that we're still working under research for improving threat intelligence and incident response systems, okay? So from that aspect, architecturally, what we did and part of the rationale for why we use the XMPP architecture was that we needed to break the management functions from the data agility that was needed. By data agility, I'm talking about the fact that in the ecosystem today, we're showing you how we can share the identity aggregate information out of ICE, but now with ICE 1.4, other third-party vendors, and you might see other services coming out of ICE, sharing other types of information. For instance, threat incident reports, okay? So in order to do that, what we did was we broke out the controller management functions into what you're seeing up above, the, what we're calling the PX Grid controller. Basically, the role of that function is to be able to ensure and provide the security behind the ecosystem. By the security, what we're talking about is to make sure that that ICE persona, that MNT persona that you're talking to, is really an ICE box, and it's authorized to share that information, okay? So as we move forward and we allow other third parties to come into the ecosystem, both to publish information and consume, I think you guys would feel it's important to know that, yes, they really are authorized. Not only are they authorized to play in the PX Grid system, but that they really are authorized to share that very information or to consume that very information that they're seeking, okay? The second aspect that we did was, from breaking the control function, providing the data agility, by data agility, coming back again, ICE MNT will prefer, will prefer to share its identity information through its own data model and its own transport protocols. So the example for that is if you are, let's say, a management visibility application and you just want to see who's on the network, to initiate your application, you need to get the live state. Well, if you're a very large deployment, that state could be gigabytes of data, okay? You may not want that thrown at you through a notification. You may actually want to do an optimized query, have some compression in that data model. So doing that level of synchronization and how you receive that data, maybe through a different transport mechanism as well as a different data model, then if now that you've got your initial state, all you want to do is get the updates of who are the new folks coming in, what are the new devices coming into the network, or who's just left the network. Those can be the, the short updates, if you will. And for that, that's very well suited to a publish subscribe mechanism. So providing that agility was a necessity, okay? So that data agility is there. The negotiation by which you discover what can I use, what are the protocols that are there. Again, you can discover that through the controller, and then the data plane is there, presuming that you know how you want to get the data, okay? We've actually also created a client, the platform, um, the PX Grid client. The client is there to help normalize, if you will, that control and management set of functions. Are you kidding me? I'm still on the first slide. Okay. So I'll go faster. Okay. Okay, so in the client, what we do is we normalize the secure management functions of how you discover what's available in that ecosystem, how it's available in the ecosystem, and the security aspect. So as Brian was saying, right, we don't want you to have to authenticate to 
every ICE MNT out there, and if you have threat or vulnerability applications that are part of the, the ecosystem, you don't want to be burdened with establishing that many-to-many -many connection. So the client is there to help you establish that authentication and authorization once, and we, we help you with establishing the scalability of how you share, again, consume the information as well as publish the, the information in a scalable way, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go through this really quickly. How many of you have used ICE prior to version 1.3? Okay, so how many of you have actually tried to get some of the information out of ICE using the RESTful APIs? Okay, so I may not need to go through this very quickly. You know that there were some issues with respect to the scalability, the fact that you had to pull because of the transport mechanisms. So I think we've already mentioned the issues that we've talked about <clears throat> with respect to scalability and that data model agility that you're gonna start seeing as of ICE 1.4, okay? So with the ICE components, so you're getting this because I'm an architect, right? I've already mentioned the client. The client now comes in two flavors, in C and in Java, and again, some of it depends on the level of optimization and the type of application that you need to develop. So we recognize that listening to the feedback from you, the customer, we knew that we had to provide at least those two flavors. If there are other, let us know. Then um, in the actual DevNet pod and in the kit that you'll see, you're also gonna see lots of examples in my mind, but if you need more, let us know, right? So we're trying to give you enough of the information to make it easier for you to connect to the grid and immediately be able to consume the information that's coming out of ICE. In 1.4, we'll be updating the tutorial once we do, so give us a, a little bit more time to show how if you're developing application, right, and now you want to share your newly aggregated information. So if you have incident reports, or as Brian was saying, we've got partners that are creating <clears throat> and helping us aggregate with updated posture information, right? You can now add that and not only share it with ICE, but share it across your ecosystem, if you will. Okay, again, in the DevNet, um, for the testing capabilities, especially in the sandbox, everything has been configured and self-sustained so that you can come in and be ready to play with it and get a feel for what it's like to use ICE. So in there, we've instantiated virtual machines to have the ICE controller, um, both as the MNT server as well as the PX grid server, um, and so on. And then hopefully, We've been complete with all of the do documentation and walkthrough in the sample code that's there. Okay. So, with respect to the connection library, as I mentioned earlier, the library is there to help you abstract with the management functions that are needed. Okay. So, rather than you having to learn a new authentication mechanism and a new, we try to abstract them to simple API calls for how you do the authentication. Today we do the authentication <clears throat> using certificates, but there is agility there to use other types of credentials. <clears throat> and then um, based from there, you can either execute the notification through the publish subscribe registration, or you can do the direct queries. <clears throat> okay, so there are, can you get me my? Murphy's Law, <laughs> thanks. So the vision there is to be able to provide two different types of filtering. <coughs> and again, coming back to the levels of authorization of what are you allowed to publish, what are you allowed to consume, we may allow you to filter the content within a message or filter the message itself. That's the point of this slide. I'm not going to read through all of this. This is basically the instructions for how you can connect in, how to get the, um, 
<clears throat> the ice um, configured to be the um, PX grid controller where you can download the client and um, <clears throat> how you can authenticate this. So I think I have a flow further down for how we do this. So with the client library, I think I already mentioned, I don't list it here, but before you can actually start conversing and either producing or consuming information, you have to actually initiate your session, if you will, through an authentication mechanism. And then there's two mechanisms today by which you can acquire information, and that's through the publish subscribe registration for notification of updates. So typically that's for when you believe you're getting small amounts of data. But if you need, like for example, in a large deployment, gigabytes of data, you may want to use a direct query function. So there's handles to do that. <coughs> in the SDK, we try to show you the most common types of functions that are there. The new introduced one in 1.3 is the, let me make sure I get it, application, network, ANC. Yeah. Application, application, network. Performance monitoring. Performance monitoring. No, network control, the ANC API. Oh, ANC, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we, we're calling it something else internally. Externally, it's the application network connect. It's basically the set of APIs by which now, through the PX grid, you can dynamically, by dynamically I mean programmatically, change controls. So how many of you are familiar with RADIUS? Okay, good. So think change of authorization. And in the change of authorization, through ICE, we can now change, or you, <clears throat> right? We help through normalization in the API. If you think there's something amiss or you need to just change some of the policies, you can now do it programmatically. And again, remember, and this was something that I thought very strongly from a security perspective, because now we're allowing effective control of the network dynamically. And that's why it is very important that whatever application is doing that is authorized to do, right? So now what you can do is do an effective change of, of authorization through this ANC API. Okay, I'm getting the accelerate. So my last slide. So basically, I'm not gonna summarize. I think we've already harped on the goodness of the platform exchange grid and now the agility of the things that you can do behind it. We do encourage you to go in and play through the DevNet. If you've got you know, a CCO account, you can go in. You've got full access to the DevNet. We are the first security <laughs> um, pod available there, so you can't miss it. Download it, play with it. You can get started. There's a lot of um, walkthroughs that shows you both the code and written descriptive text for what's occurring throughout the different code segments. So I think I'll stop there, because you're giving me this. Also, there's, uh, there's another session on Thursday morning. It's an hour-long session. There is um, a developer ID or IP who basically will give you his uh, example of how he's developed using PXGrid. So do go for that session. It's Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Thank you.